Hey, it's Lisa, and we're back with the latest episode of Nashville on the Rocks. In this episode, I got to sit down with a very good friend of mine, someone who's been killing it in the Nashville music scene for quite a while now, the very talented guitarist and vocalist, Ping Rose. I am so happy you are on the second episode of Nashville on the Rocks. Second. Uh, yeah, the That's second cool. one. Yeah. <laughs> pretty cool. Thank you so much for coming in here today. Um, since forming this podcast, I have just been waiting to get you on. And you are married to one of my most favorite people on the planet, my friend Mitzi. My hot wife. <laughs> yeah, your hot wife. <laughs> I can see all the smiles there. So um, I know she's pretty much like your manager nowadays. Yeah. Pretty much. So I, you know, like reached out and I was like, you need to get ping on this. Like, so I'm just so happy that you're here today, that you made time. Um, you're a very busy national musician and you probably got out of all the people I know, you probably have your hands in a little bit of everything. I've really thought about this over time. I'm like, I think there's not too much that I don't see you being involved in. You've played downtown, obviously, for a long time. You've played on Second Avenue. You've got your own band. You got another band that you're in. You know, you play with all the rock guys. Like, you play with some of the country guys. Like, you've done a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So diving into this and just getting to know you a little bit more for all the lovely people watching this. Um, can you just kind of give me a little bit of background? Like what got you into music in the first place? Like, is it something you just grew up doing and took for granted? Or do, do you remember a time when it like clicked with you or sort of, um, I've always, as far back as I can remember myself and my family have been involved in music in some form, whether it be, um, something as small as everybody singing at church. Um, somebody from the family leading a church song, mm -hmm. being in the choir at church, um, or being in the choir at school, or I was in band as far back as sixth grade playing stuff like tuba. Ah, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so I've always had sort of a propensity towards music. It was never my, growing up, it was never my main concentration. But once I got through about the midway through my college career and started just gigging professionally, which is basically what I've been doing since then the yeah. whole time it's been the mainstay because it's been it makes more sense when I put everything together and operate from there as opposed to how I was way more apprehensive when I first started out as a, as a professional musician actually going for it thinking that I had to you know have been able to play in the London Philharmonic or something like that so that's kind of interesting so when you start out doing music like it sounds like you know you were singing in church you had a little bit in your background but it sounds like you also had like a good amount of band influence just because I feel like a lot of kids when they're younger like if you don't do music in your household or you're just like your first uh introduction to music per se is with like choir or a band practice or whatever like I've got some bad like six years of flute under my belt okay so I'm just gonna let you know that but I feel like yeah that's what people do is they they play an instrument and then sometimes they go to school for music and then they come out like singing for a choir or like you said like playing the philharmonic somewhere like that's a that's a certainly a very real goal for people so what did you go to college for did you go for music i took music as a sort of an elective and i finished college with sort of a music business concentration okay and i was scholarshiped to play music Oh, for cool. the school choir. I was scholarshiped as a guitar player finishing school, but I originally attended my first four years as a international studies major, which is code for political sciences with a, lang a foreign language concentration, and mine was Japanese. Oh, wow, okay. But I was taking, like, you know, I had my core classes for my major and stuff, but I would always, you know, sneak a guitar class, like a classical guitar class in here, <laughs> or jazz guitar one or something like that. Yeah. And, you know, because I wasn't, I was playing and I had like some music experience with blues stuff, but I didn't, I could read music because of, you know, school and stuff like that. And I was heavy into rock and alternative stuff like that 
growing up, but I had never, ever connected any of those dots. So it's like okay. what you said, like how people grow up doing one thing and then just, it's not the same thing. I didn't, I didn't get it like that. It wasn't, I, when I, it took me, when I first started playing bass, like playing gigs, gigs on bass, I, I didn't connect the tuba thing until for a long time, Okay, which makes, which makes weird sense because that's how I found out that I'm better at reading bass clef than I am treble clef. Okay. Is because I remembered how to read music for tuba while I was playing a bass gig and reading it. See, and that's so it, it ties in together. It's yeah. just that when you're thinking about a band, you know, especially if you're thinking about like a rock band or something like that, or even a blues band, like, you know, something like tuba doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. translate as well, but it's, it doesn't matter. It's the fact that you know, you remember that and you remember the music part of it and it tied it together for you. So when was your first band? Okay, so long time ago, I had an alternative rock band. I used to, we call it like whatever, you know, we couldn't figure out a name because it was back when everybody, every, everything was something core. <laughs> you know? What year are we talking about? Not, we don't have to date you or anything like your age, but like, just give me an idea of like what we're talking about. We're talking about like early two thousands. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right, that sounds like, that sounds right. Two thousand five to mm -hmm. like two thousand nine, maybe. Okay, I had a band with my friends called Controlled Substance that evolved into a different band that I ended up leading called, uh, and I played guitar mostly in Controlled Substance, and that was like a sort of think about like the Pixies mixed with Incubus and some Hendrix stuff going on, heavy stuff. Nice. And then like it evolved into a more sort of hair metal-y glam thing with everybody wearing makeup and I added another guitar player that was also a shredder. That's guy awesome. Named Mario, a good friend of mine from Memphis and that was called Velvet Transit. And after that... That's kind I, of a cool name. <laughs> yeah, it was. Very cool. <laughs> That's a great name. And we did some recording in Memphis with some cool guys and stuff like that but that didn't last forever. And that, um after that, we ended up, uh, I ended up just, that's when I became like a guitar player for hire. Okay. And that's when I started getting gigs with like my best friend Poye and stuff like that. We were playing with country dudes out in Memphis. This is before I moved up. No kidding. So I was doing like that kind of stuff and like church gigs and Beale Street. And so, yeah. Yeah. So, holy shit. So there's so much to, to go into from this. So I guess I want to know two things. Like, how did you make the jump from playing in bands and playing in choir and whatever and like, to getting into a rock band was it pretty natural for you or did it just the jump is backwards the jump is backwards okay yeah. so i was were... in rock bands first really yeah I've, I've done singing in choir but like i said like playing guitar and stuff growing up like you know i was singing in choir and i had propensity music and my parents had me on i was obsessed with michael jackson as a kid stuff like that right like and i used to listen to prince a bunch still listen to prince a bunch sure but i was listening to like rock music my favorite band is still like afi Oh, I love so, AFI. Yeah, and so I was into that kind of stuff. When I was first learning guitar, I'm going to date myself again, but the first <laughs> song that I learned on guitar was Ariel's. No kidding. Yeah, by System of Down. So when I was first playing guitar, that's what I was doing that kind of stuff. Oh Radio God. rock and like whatever, whatever else I could get my hands on. Because, you know, back then we had only had stuff like Napster and Kazaa and yep. LimeWire. So mm -hmm. you don't have oh complete God. access to everything like you have right now. Or you can you can literally snap your finger or tell your phone you want to listen to this. Yeah. And you Napster can do that. was the closest thing. Yeah. So I could. So it was basically whatever I could get my hands on. And that kind of stuff was it. And I also worked at Hot Topic for a good three, two or three years. So. Oh whenever I could get God. cheap out of there with my employee discount yeah that's awesome yeah. okay so like how old were you when you were in your first band probably about 17 17 okay yeah I feel like that's like a decent an age where like most people uh get into their first bands if not a little bit sooner like um so you were like in <coughs> rock first which is mm -hmm. so freaking cool I love that and was that just a really natural fit for you or did that like I mean, you grew up in Memphis. That's between Memphis and Chattanooga. Ch Memphis and Chattanooga. Yeah. Okay, so this is I didn't know that. Okay, so, but that is still just like one of those things. Out of all the music that you could have had influences with, especially like geographically, mm -hmm. like the fact that you kind of tied into rock a little bit more. Like, was that just pretty natural? Did you think about it? Was it just something you just you just dug it, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's rock. It was dope, and there was like. There was an energy to it that I didn't get from the other music that I was listening to. And, you know, I, I, we all, the melody, rhythm, and harmony all does different things to us. So, you know, there's there's plenty of good music. I'm not saying the music that I was listening to 
before I was listening to rock isn't as good. What I'm saying is I was I had a friend that my best friend that I was in that first band with, he um he had a guitar and I had a guitar when I was seven, but I didn't learn how to play it. It ended up it was like a Walmart guitar or whatever. It mm. ended up it ended up um out on the street. But I wanted a guitar still. I really wanted to learn guitar. And um my friend had a guitar and that's the kind of stuff he was into. Okay. So I it was whatever I could figure out and whatever I could read on tabs that wasn't as complex because like now I you know, I'll still read a tab or something like that. I prefer to then actually no I wouldn't. I wouldn't prefer to read a tab because mm-hmm. it'll the tabs get wrong. But back then I didn't know what I know now. Mm-hmm. So I had to learn whatever I could. I didn't have like guitar teachers like that. I had friends who would teach me like a little bit of stairway to heaven mm. or I figured out power chords so I could figure out me any Green Day song and I know how to use drop D That's awesome. and then I got a hold of like some Hendrix books and then I started understanding a little bit of theory because I didn't connect when I learned how to read music I didn't know theory a lot of people can read music very well and have no understanding of theory because they don't have to they just have to read what's on the paper sure so when I was reading when I was younger I didn't know keys and stuff like that I right. mean I knew how to look at look at a key signature but I didn't know how to solo through that kind of stuff okay. and that kind of thing so I got into Hendrix when I was about I'd say like 16 or 17, some, some, somewhere around there. And that's what made me able to be able to play in bands and mm-hmm. hear other people playing something and play along with it. Because before that, it was just like, um, I can play Fade to Black. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Metallica's Fade to Black. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And just kind of like go along with <laughs> other things like by ear and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't until like, You know, and that makes sense. You know, I feel like so that's interesting. I'm always interested to hear people like what their background and what their story is, you know, behind getting into music, because I feel like it's so important. Everybody's got their own journey. And I feel like it's it's just about how, like, you think about it and then like how quickly you adjust to it. And like, I I know I'm one of those people where it's like I didn't even I mean, I listen to this. God, this is dating myself, but I listened to the Spice Girls forever, like, you know, eighth grade, ninth grade, like that was my generation. And then I didn't start. I listened to like my first album that I really bought for myself that I got into was Alanis Morissette, you know, Jagged Jagged Little Little Pill. Pill. Yes, that was cool. But even then I was still listening to, you know, like pop music and Mm -hmm. whatnot. It wasn't until like. I was in high school that like I, you know, got my hands on Guns N' Roses. Like I didn't have anybody in my family that like listened to rock. So I had to kind of like, I would seek it out and I'd be like, oh my God, that sounds fucking awesome. What is that? You know, and then just do my own research, like you say, through like people's CDs. Like there wasn't Mm -hmm. just having this thing on your phone. This is like, you know, back when we, I was talking about the downloading thing, but this is when that are very short, if you look at it nowadays, how short the history was, but this is our little short history of burning CDs and stuff between each other. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. But now it's like, Siri, find me Def Leppard. Siri, find yeah. me Deep Purple. Like, yeah. it wasn't any of that. You had yeah. to know someone that had the CD or you had to go and just buy it, you, you know? you got lucky enough to hear it on the radio or exactly. something like that. Exactly, hear it on the radio. Like, radio was so big back, you know, just then. And it's not like a whole lot of time, right, babe? That's What's my that? husband on the the that's engineering for us hey, today. Hey, I'm DA. probably out of focus and everything, but hey, hey y'all. No, you look All good. Right. You're always in focus. Oh, thanks. So, babe. but uh, even though it hasn't been like a, a ton of time that's passed, there's so much that's changed since then. Like technology wise, that's made it so much easier for musicians and you know people like to learn music. You know, with the pros and cons, and that can be debated. But you know, I mean, babe, you were still able to like go into record stores and like listen to records. You know, when I when I was kind of you know that wasn't an doing option. my thing. People actually liked music, and there was an <laughs> audience. There was an audience for it. It yeah. really was. Now you know. Now we were competing with people that love video games and shit. And, like, <laughs> I mean, yeah. as early as like freaking. I mean, as well, I'll say as early as like freaking. I would say like two thousand eight, two thousand nine. I was still sitting in records, local record stores around Memphis with some headphones on that are at the little stations. You're testing yeah, out CDs. So that's you, true. You could at least do that. But like, nowadays, it's like, I don't even know if they have a store where you can, do, you know, do, do, what's the incentive? I don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, what's the point? You know, yeah. like, that opens up a whole other can of worms. Yeah. Um, so, so getting back to like, so you had your first guitar when you were seven mm-hmm. and then you ended up picking up again later so would you say i mean you play a lot of things like you play bass you play ukulele would you say that playing guitar is like your main gig and like yes did you feel just like a connection to playing guitar guitar 
is how is my basis for understanding music. Okay. Um, I was doing things before guitar and I've done things post learning the guitar, but I understand how to operate within a musical situation most proficiently on a guitar, but also when I'm, what, when I think theory wise, that mm -hmm. theory comes from the guitar first. Most people, it might come from the piano, piano. when they think this yep. way. But even like vocal lines or single lines or harmonies or rhythms, it's going to be guitar in my head first. And that counts as bass too. Okay. That makes sense. The, yeah. Yeah. And that makes sense. Like it's, it's so interesting to hear that because uh, they're you're not the same instrument. I'm not no. saying they're the same instrument in my head, but theory wise and how to move in a linear fashion or up and down guitar and bass are me like it, what, yeah. I, where I, what I get well it just transitions well for you mm -hmm. and you can play so much I mean you're so versatile uh, and that's what kind of leads me to uh, kind of my next question is that like growing up like so you're in between Chattanooga and Memphis mm -hmm. and then like you lived in Memphis like you graduated yeah. from Memphis and you went to school in Knoxville right no no, no. I graduated from I graduated high school in Chattanooga. Okay. And that was a sort of a liberal arts high school. And that was one of the places where music oh. theory, that's when I first learned music theory because it was my elective. Okay. And I still didn't learn theory for guitar. I just knew like theory to where I could go into a music school and test out of theory one. Okay. Yeah, because my teacher only taught us from a piano and we all sat down with no instruments. Right. So I didn't I, I didn't have enough smart I, I didn't know enough music at the time to actually really work that out. I wasn't in the right space musically yeah. in my head because I was still like, you know, I just discovered I wouldn't say I had just discovered rock, but I'd been around rock a long enough time to make that my identity as like a kid to have been like pop music and R and B or below me now. So I was <laughs> you know, I was I was I was that kind of stupid. So that probably has a lot to lend to why I didn't connect those dots yet. Yeah. But at the but my major when I was in the liberal arts high school cuz you had to pick a major. Mine was visual art. Okay. So my concentrations were illustration and design. That's why I have right. this skill for like people I've designed a lot of people's logos yeah. especially since the pandemic. But yeah, that's where that skill comes from is okay. literally doing that. Okay. And that was my first like music theory elective and I went to University of Memphis for the political sciences and stuff like that. I got that backwards, okay. Yeah, and then I went to Bethel where I met, where I met Mitzi. Okay. And that's where I was scholarship to play for a choir. Okay, no yeah. kidding. I ended up graduating actually with a general studies degree because I was gonna switch my major to music business, but I had all of my, I had all of my classes done and they just wanted me to uh, take another six semesters so six semesters is three years they wanted me to take another six semesters of just recital hours before they were going to give me my degree and i was like no dude i'm doing general studies and they're like are you what? sure like do you know that's not you know a general little studies degree doesn't do as much as a lot of other degrees and i'm like well it'll do more than me staying in school for another three years that's crazy <laughs> yeah oh my god yeah. babe can you believe that no i can't believe that <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so my technical degree is in general studies, but if okay. you look at my transcript, it's insane. Yes. Because my minor was African American studies at U of M, and I didn't have a minor at um, Bethel. I just was taking all the music business classes, which sure. the program is not wasn't that in depth. So I finished those in less than a year and a half. Oh my god. Yeah. Well, especially taking another three. Okay. Yeah. Only three, huh? Only three years, <laughs> six semesters. Yeah. Yeah. God, it's hilarious. Oh, okay, yeah. so. When did you end up, like after you graduated, mm -hmm. you stayed in Memphis for a little bit? Not really. No. I stayed in Memphis for a week and did my first cruise ship and then got done with that. Yeah, because I yeah we left that part out. I keep I always forget that, that no, I did that. I agree. That's <laughs> and I'm, I'm I, still part time a cruise ship musician. Sometimes they'll call me out for a fill in, or I'll come I'll have to go out and do something. I'm probably going out next year with Black Opry on a different cruise ship than I normally go out on. But I did a ship and then got done with that ship. And Mincy was already up here. And I was in Memphis for a week. I used my ship money, bought a car, and moved up here. Oh, that's so <laughs> yeah. funny. And that's actually like when I first met Mitzi was mm -hmm. that you were away. You were on a cruise ship. That was my second or third one. Okay. Yeah. So, and it was funny um, because you were gone for a while. So, mm -hmm. some of those crews, they last for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Five to six months, which is four Damn. to six months, which is why I kind of was pretty much the biggest reason I quit. Yeah. Was my only grievance is like, because. Like most importantly, I have a life at home, especially with Mitzi. Like mm -hmm. we are, like, got our pets and stuff, and we have I'm paying for a house back here. Yeah. But um, 
it's so difficult to go out for a full contract and then try to come back and get reestablished yeah. for like gigs and stuff. That's got to be very similar to like going on the road. <coughs> I would think just in general, like touring for a while I and mean, yeah. just being gone. Uh, I know a lot of people talk about that. It's hard for people to like go on the road and then, you know, for long stretches of time and then come back and something like a cruise ship, you're a little bit more removed because you're in the water. So I would say it's different because you're usually gone for months on end as opposed to weeks on end. Yeah. With a cruise ship contract as opposed to a road road dates, sure. road, road road run or something like that. I've done a few road runs and these days with modern stuff, Road runs usually don't consist of the actual road. You get the right artist and everything's plane tickets anyway. Okay. Yeah, so that's so travel time is but then you got to go with dealing with planes and stuff like that which you got to deal with in the um, going to the cruise ship anyway. Sure. And, well, um, it's almost like you're you're on their schedule. Yeah. But then if you're like on a cruise ship, like you don't I'm sure that it's everything's kind of set in stone for you. There's not as much movement. As you would You'd be think. surprised because really? all that stuff is all that stuff. You, you have an entire you have an entire mini society, probably like a good <laughs> more than a small town's worth of people traveling on one vessel through the open ocean. And so all of that scheduling gets condensed and condensed down to like about um, about three or four different directors and mistakes always happen. Okay. You are literally moving the entire time. <laughs> um, you, you live there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're so, playing your gig, you're not going back home, you're not going back to, yeah, you know, yeah. you're not going to a hotel room or whatever. Right? And you know, those aren't, the uh, those are just things I'm listening right now, those aren't the worst parts about it. Like that's not, that's not, the, th those aren't like this issues, my, my biggest issue is like the, the time away from home and I'm, actually in the same place at the whole time sure. i get to go see different ports yep. but i'm in um this room's about three or four times the size of my living uh, oh. of a decent of a decent set of living quarters of a cabin yeah, yeah, yeah oh yeah. man so yeah. you they kind of make it so like you have to you know get out and do things mm -hmm. yeah. you know because if you stay in there you're gonna go crazy all mm -hmm. the time mm -hmm. so what was some of the coolest things about being on the cruise ship though um the bands are really fucking good. Mm. Um, the bands that I get to play with, I've seldom had a bad experience. Um, every band that I have been out with, every single band that I've played with, I can list some serious accolades as far as the other musicians go. Like, leave me out of the equation. These okay. guys are top of the crop. That's where I, that's that's sort of my stock. That's like my real training ground. That's when I became a yeah. different sort of musician because sure. playing for the choir does not teach me did not teach me how to listen. Like I had to learn for like playing cruise ships, which is kind of how I ended up getting so many gigs when I moved here because I had already had the experience of most people look at a cruise ship gig like, all right, I got to know how to read and all these jazz standards, be able to hack it with these sort of musicians. Well, my cruise ship gig is play that record verbatim. Yeah. Play the record verbatim. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you have to do to do that. Mm -hmm. Do it. Just do it. Mm -hmm. Wow. That that would be such a jump to mm -hmm. just such a learning curve. You know, it's kind of like being on your own internship, mm -hmm. you know. And a lot of people mistakenly think that that's easy. Yeah. A lot of people think, oh, I got this. I know the chords. I know this, the melody, yada, yada, yada. And they play their version of it or something they've seen somebody get away with before. Mm -hmm. But... You'll get checked immediately. Yeah. And so we got checked immediately. We were young. We were freaking this before I moved to Nashville. So I was like 23. Yeah. And yeah. And I was playing with dudes 40 to 50 years my senior who right. knew their job. Right. And yeah. So I had to learn. Yeah. Really well, that, quickly. That's what it is. It's not like it's it's your job in that yeah. sense. So it's like you're all the things that you think of, like it's work, you know, mm -hmm. it's fun work and it's something that probably ignites your soul and just playing music, but it is work. So it's the same thing. Like if you're playing, you know, a gig at Bowie's or Acme or Black Rabbit, you know, it's the same kind of concept, which as a working musician, I think people really forget about that. You know, people that, you know, it's a separation of like people going to a show and people being part of a show that you have a job to do. You have like you have you're trying to put something on for people and your standards are a certain level, you know, because if, if they weren't, no one would come out and see you It would mm -hmm. be terrible, mm -hmm. you know. So I think that's really interesting that 
you know, that was like a good learning experience from you. So it's really hard to describe that without it trying to sound like a flex. Yeah. Because I, I, I stress this to people like a lot of times because I always, I recommend people for the cruise ship gig. If people want the cruise ship gig, I tell them what they need to do. And it sounds easy yeah. on the front end, but I'm, I tell them, especially a lot of guys here don't, because see the cruise ship gig is mostly concentrated out of Memphis, but there's plenty of people here oh. because they come, because we, a lot of us moved up here. Up here, yeah. Yeah, and um, one of the one of the biggest things I tell cats is just learn just learn the song like quit trying to people will see me shred or something or they'll see Poirier like playing a really funky bass line and like I have to have that technique so I can do what they're doing and it's like nobody yeah Mm-mm. you're just learning the song that's not I literally learn tunes and learn how to interact with other people you know how to work with that and when mm-hmm. you know if you know how to read other people on stage. Mm-hmm. That's pretty. Yes. That's pretty crazy. It's very important. And I had to learn the second part of what you just said, mm-hmm. separate from, um, separate from me learning the record because that was my thing when I first moved. I wouldn't say my musical growth is complete now, but when I first moved to Nashville with the set of skills I'm talking about right now, my musical growth was still incomplete Mm -hmm. because I specifically was always like whatever song they're sending me, I'm playing it just like the record. Well, I'm no longer on a cruise ship when I'm on Broadway. Right. So everybody doesn't do that. No. Yeah. So I had to learn how to put my ear on what's going on because I don't, you can't rely on everybody like you're relying on six or uh, like you're relying on, five or six other musicians you live around for about five months sure yeah well it that makes so so much sense and i think that that goes <laughs> with everything you're talking about that's what makes you such a such a versatile player i think that it's like you just keep adding and i've gotten the pleasure to know you over the years so mm-hmm. you just keep adding more and more and more skills which is why i think that it's so fine to me. I'm like, yeah, Ping's involved in literally everything. Like, if you are in the Nashville like music scene in any way, shape, or form, like, you probably know Ping. Like, he, you might. <laughs> yeah, you do. And so, uh, talking about that. So, moving here, when you moved here and you got off the cruise ships, mm-hmm. you know, you're done with school. Like, you you're kind of moving on and learning other things. Like, you had all your rock experience behind you. Which, by the way, what was your first rock album you bought i just need to know this for me okay the first rock album i bought yeah so the sheet said the first album i bought and i had, and I <laughs> okay, had a different answer what's, the, what's it's your gonna first surprise album you, you bought I'll, it's I'll gonna surprise that too. you it's gonna surprise it was euro pop by eiffel 65 okay the blue dabba d all right <laughs> yeah that was the first cd i bought <laughs> ever <laughs> but the first rock album i bought oh jeez was it afi no well you guys see we're talking about bought and we're talking about the era of LimeWire. Oh yeah, yeah. Whichever, whichever. <laughs> and you know, the one I you did buy "Sing the Sorrow," but I don't know if that was the first rock album I bought. Oh, that's I funny. think the first rock album I bought it was not when it came out. Well, that's okay because that just means that you know you had learned a lot in the process. Well, you've probably gotten so many. So give me a couple that you did have, like. Okay, so I did have Sing the Sorrow. I had AFI's discography. I I had Uh, AFI's discography. I love him as a singer. He's fantastic. (laughs) There's a Japanese rock band that I was really heavy into in high school called Deer and Gray. Okay. Um, I have most of their discography up until a certain point, um, which is actually why I chose Japanese as my freaking foreign language concentration in college. It wasn't anime. It was so I could understand these crazy bands I was listening (laughs) to. Straight up, for real. Yeah, because you like anime, too. Yeah. That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I was like, I'm a comic dude. Like I collect comics. I got a comic book YouTube channel and stuff like that. But, yeah. Yeah, but that, that, most of that is actually rooted in music. Me speaking Japanese and all that. Holy so that's shit. literally that's rooted funny. In music. And what was the name of the rock band? Deer and Gray. That's D I R E N Gray. Deer and Gray. Yeah. Interesting. Um, is it so? Is it more like metal or is it more like? They started out as a more like J poppy band, like okay. alternative stuff. But their later stuff, when they ended up going to Rock and Ring and stuff, like okay. their first American concerts oh, and stuff like that, okay. they yep. started getting really heavy because they yep. were touring with like Corn and stuff. Yep. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> figure why not? We're gonna tap into this. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. probably yeah. a nice like yeah. <laughs> segue. Oh but, my um, god! I did have. I think it was. Okay, it was. 
the hate breed cd okay <laughs> yeah. that's hilarious yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah it was oh a hate breed God. cd and i think i had white pony like i said I didn't, this this yes. wasn't when they came out i got them because cool. i was like all right man i need some rock cds right yeah <laughs> and the black album yes okay yeah Fantastic. Yeah. I, I forget the whole idea about like Napster and whatnot too, because I was in college when Napster was really out, like early college. Mm -hmm. And so like it was just this whole idea that you I mean, back then it would take like two hours to download a song. Mm -hmm. You'd like, Oh, I'm gonna download this song, but I'm gonna be able to down like all of A C D C, you know. So I was like, the whole album, I'm just gonna be able to do it. There or was like a crapshoot to whether what you download what, yeah. what it says you downloaded was like, what, and then it probably had like some random producer tag on the front of it, or it was like yeah, this weird. Or remix. it was just at a totally yeah, like whatever it <laughs> was yeah. it was like oh god so i think but my first uh my first like rock album i bought other than like alanis morissette was um guns and roses which one uh so appetite for destruction okay. yeah that was my first one and i can remember that because it was such a pivotal moment for me um but i had jagged little pill yeah yeah forgiven is my shit yes yeah. no that whole yeah. i think I, I was in seventh grade i my parents knew what i was listening to yeah. they probably didn't even <laughs> want to know i think they had no idea but i wore that like cd like pretty much out so it was great hey babe what was your first album i know what my first album is is uh acdc back in black <laughs> that's right classic Awesome. Now, are you saying the first album you bought? Because the first album I had that I kept that was mine that my parents gave to me was Michael Jackson's Dangerous and The History, the That's compilation. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The History. It's yeah. Good. I ended up getting that too. Oh my God. Well, like, again, this, like we talk about, this was a time that, you know, people, which when we were thinking about asking questions, I was like, I want to know what like the first album people listen to. He's like, are you sure that people listen to albums nowadays? I was like, right. I have to look at my audience and I have to look at my guests and I have to think of like, what was your first download? You know, like what was your yeah. first whatever? Yeah. So that's super funny. Okay. Wow. Because it, wow. <coughs> yes. You really have to do that. No, you we're, do. We're, yeah, it wasn't even like that. a thought to me. And I was mm. like, Oh my God. Um, okay. So moving forward, like now, now you're in Nashville and, Obviously, it sounds like you hit the ground running, playing gigs, pretty much. Sort of. Sort um, of. Yes. Tell me I'm more. I'm playing with the same. I'm playing with almost the same people I started playing with when I moved to Nashville. Okay. Um, it's been like Corey what eight Mack, years? Ten. Ten, ten years. Ten come September. Wow. Uh, my buddy Corey Mack, my friend who actually lives close to me, his name is Alex Kramer. Um, Alex and I went oh, to Alex college together. Okay. So Alex had me pretty well i would go see wherever alex was playing and he was really good about introducing me to people and yeah. getting me connected on the front end if he had a gig that he needed to give away yeah. i was one of the first ones he would call and he got me set up with the wedding company that i worked for for a few years sure so yeah i owe a lot of that to him on, on like a really good tip but um i was working at school of rock i worked at school of rock for four years when i moved here that's right i was teaching um because i got hired at school of rock in memphis and then got offered my first I got offered my first contract immediately after I got hired, so okay. I left. And I basically got transferred from there to here as far okay. as work goes. And I did that for four years. And um, it was, to be honest, um, during the time, during that four years when I was teaching, I was trying to keep a regular job mm -hmm. and no shade to what I was doing or no shade to the art of teaching or that school in particular, because they took good care of me for a good four years, kept me working. Even when I would go back out and go back out on the cruise ship and come and back, come I always back. had a job ready That's when awesome. I came back. So uh, I do owe them that. Um, but I was sort of the way that time was the way that time was working out, and the way that um, kids' attention spans versus drunk people's attention spans work <laughs> working out. I was making a lot more money playing out of bars. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Than I was like sitting around sitting around at school all day. Yeah. And it came to a point where I was um where I had to pick one. Yeah. And Mitzi was working bars. She still works at bars. I still work in bars, even though we both travel and do all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. We both have gigs, but I was I was I was looking at like, you know, make this much from a lesson. Sure. Or make this much from basically what amounts to a shift a and shift. i had worked as a waiter and a bartender on beale street so i knew mm -hmm. the shift life right so i was like this ain't this ain't a problem and i was yeah. i i trans i transitioned to that fully because that's easier to set up a well hey i gotta go out of town and go do this gig right quick i'll be right back sure then it is to like okay i need to go out of town 
and I need to get this this lesson taken care of, get somebody else to teach this lesson for me, make sure this kid doesn't know I'm here, mm -hmm. having all these students in a database, yada, yada, yada. It's very, it's a lot of juggling and organizing. Yeah. Now, so you obviously have been doing this for a long time, so mm -hmm. a lot of the a lot of the verbiage that you're using makes sense. Can you tell us what, for maybe people that don't know, like what a shift is like when okay, you're downtown? Okay, so a shift in any, a shift, when you're thinking of shifts, we're talking specifically service industry. Mm -hmm. And what we do as musicians, especially in a city like Nashville, is integral to our service engine, like to keep stay lubricated and keep moving. Mm -hmm. Without that, we're in a little bit of a halt. You saw it during you saw it during the pandemic and post how they sort of drug ass with like rehiring bands mm -hmm. and like sort of sticking DJs in certain places yep. and nobody was coming in. Right. Then as soon as the bands came, um, there were more people out. Yeah. Since before the pandemic, because they were hard headed and didn't care about the, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. didn't care about the pandemic. And so right. you saw that picture of Kids Rocks that one summer. Oh my God. Like, yeah, that, that was, was crazy. Yeah, but so that is, that's service industry and that that's driven by the service industry. And everybody in the service industry is all of the, all of equal importance. When I say, I mean like custodians, I mean food staff, I mean bar staff, I mean security, I mean management, I mean, I mean entertainment mm -hmm. and so when I say a shift I mean I understand what it means to be a part of that system mm. that's Not, a great yeah. way to explain it yeah yeah because everybody if you're going to be an entertainer and you're going to always do it with the way the market is oversaturated today you need to have your foot in something like that all the time so mm -hmm. I mean I understand getting famous and you know I would love it I would welcome it but I do go do really big gigs mm -hmm. but at the same time that's not every day all day all year yeah so i need to have a foot in something like me playing in bars because yeah. i get to and i play i have some good residencies yeah you some, do you yeah, have some great residencies i have some good residencies that i've worked to keep over years from stuff that we talked about earlier mm -hmm. you know musicality work about who i hire yeah about familiarity about the product we cultivate and yada 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 sure and that's what keeps that going so yeah working shifts is literally all of that and that's what I find like so incredibly interesting that another reason why I like of doing this podcast, like getting to obviously give a platform to musicians for people to talk about things, to like kind of talk about the music, like what's on their mind, the things they want to talk about. It's also so people that don't know, like maybe have been to Nashville, but don't know enough about Nashville, get a chance to like hear what it's like to be a musician here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nashville is like a smaller Austin and the way, actually I said was, now- It's probably bigger. Now Nashville is more like Austin than Austin was in 2009 when oh, I was wow. there. Okay. Yeah. So that's just crazy. So yeah, so it's I think it's important for people to realize too is that like, well, it's like that was the first time I ever heard about like a recurring show other than New York. When you talk about Broadway, maybe it's just because of where I came from was that like Vegas has recurring shows. And it's kind of the same thing when you have, you know, live music here. You know, it's it's the same thing. Like it's a bunch of the same musicians playing different gigs, you know, and they're hard to get into. And as they should be, you know, because it's a reliability factor. It's a talent factor. And um you know, it takes a certain type of person to kind of go through that grind of playing yeah. in, to some of these people. Well, you know? and you know, you know me, but I'm going to say this because we're recording. So everybody <laughs> else don't know me like that. <laughs> but there's certain places that I won't play. Yeah, I get that. I've um, for since 2020 outside of a CMA, um, a CM, I don't know, an Americana Fest gig that I did with Jerry Pentecost mm -hmm. last year, I've only played at Acme on Broadway since like 2020. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not knocking Broadway, but that's just not my swing. Yeah. I play in the alley. I play at the blues bars. Yeah. I play in my hardcore band and I travel. Yeah. I mean, the Broadway hustle is a different breed. It's I a, can't, it's a I'm hard not, beast, right? Yeah. I'm not cut out for that. Like, I can do some every now and then and I can help somebody out with a fill in or something mm -hmm. like that because I can learn songs and I know songs and I can know a couple different instruments. But there are dudes who make their bread probably more than me, probably make more money than me, um, especially in town, doing that day in, day out. Yeah. And that's. It's a wear and tear, though. It's the same. I mean, what I would imagine, it's the same thing as working on Broadway as like a bartender or a server. Mm -hmm. Like it has, uh, you know, Serena coined it perfectly to me was dealing with different personalities. And mm -hmm. I was like, that is so true. Like the, just the amount of 
you know, debauchery, fun it's a or not fun that happens. Nashville, yes, just, it is just between two intersections. Yes. And one intersection, you know, if you get sef- second and mm-hmm. Broadway, between second and Broadway and second and Commerce are two different Nashvilles. Yes, totally different, totally yeah. different crowd of people. Yeah, you know, it's it's really wild to say that. So it's cool that you said that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, you moving to Nashville and and coming in here. And so then you start so you start playing some live gigs and uh what kind of happened next for you? Did you form the anti heroes? Yeah. Your I, band? Yeah, I needed something. I I was playing with a lot of different people and I've always just made my end goal is always to just have my own band because yeah. I'm a singer. Yeah. And I'm a singer as well as a guitar player. Like there's two se- separate well, and, and together. You're a badass guitar player and you're a badass <laughs> singer too. I've, I've you're always, a always, real guitar player and a real singer too. I just wanted to be like George Benson. A lot of people don't know that George Benson is playing the guitar on a lot of the records he's singing on and like yeah. don't know that he's singing on some of the records and not playing guitar at all on all of them. And I've always just like loved George Benson because he's that great at both. So I've been right. about that for a long time. <laughs> but um, I... I started playing, so I did have my band uh, go early on, and it's been the same name the entire time because I like comic books and comic book movies. Such a cool and stuff name. like that. So that's what anti heroes comes from because mm-hmm. it's a specific type of comic book character trope. And so that's what I was. That's what I was going after, being like you know funny. No, I, I didn't even know that, but I, I had a feeling it was tied to something with that. Yeah. But I didn't even know that either. Yeah, like Deadpool's not a hero; he's an anti-hero. Ah. And I'm making my band after Deadpool, but see, that's the <laughs> that's the idea. Like Batman's not really a hero; he beats the hell out of people. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's an anti-hero, but he gets work done. <laughs> yeah. He's a badass, like you know, yeah. anti-hero. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so but, how how do you categorize like the anti-heroes? Like, is it a rock band? Um. At heart, yes, but really a blues band. Yeah. Um, because I come from Memphis and like blue, blues is the root of me understanding music. Move, b- blues took me into understanding rock music, into understanding R and B, into understanding jazz on a theory tip. Um, it took a long time for me to get off of blues because I have a different. When, I have a different view of blues than a lot of other people. When you, I call myself a blues person, a blues man, or a blues player. But a lot of people relegate blues to just pentatonic scales and dominant seven chords and some a little shuffles, and they play it with their favorite uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan inflection. No shade on Stevie Ray Vaughan. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that everybody who plays blues seems to terribly try to copy Stevie Ray Vaughan, mm. as opposed to the spirit of what blues is. I'm like, you know, BB King's considered the the king of the blues, but seldom do you hear somebody mention bb king first that's true when you hear about blues or blues guitar and that's where i come from with blues yeah that's where i come from with blues is um like the diversity in blues and the diversity of blues is literally every form of american popular music right every version of american popular music is rooted in blues including country Mm because the only difference at the inception was the race of the performer they were playing the same thing yeah. But it's just like, okay, this is country and this is blues for reasons we're not going to talk about that, very, that are very obvious. <laughs> <laughs> for reasons we're not going to talk about. That are super obvious. And like, yeah. you know, we even still have that nowadays because the the modern country that people complain about and the modern rap that people complain about, the difference is the race of the performer. Yeah, <laughs> it's I the can same see thing. I can like see we like we're literally living. We're still that that never left. That's like, that whole thing that, that sort of moved up through because you know you had like solid gold soul and oldies and blue eyed stuff, and then you had like country politan and and rock music and country music sort of moved directions because rock music at its inception is like blues, yeah, you know, sped up with a little bit of distortion. But now if you play blues sped up with a little bit of distortion, it's considered like bluesy or right, like bluesy. something yeah something like that but it's just and it's also genres like get weird yeah it's also like different genres and labels that people are mm-hmm. just trying to and that's the one thing i think about nashville is that it's just like like a melting pot of a bunch of different genres which is really cool to see you know you have people a lot of people that are from memphis mm-hmm. you have a lot of people that are from all over and they just come in and they're blending and it's not just country and there's mm-hmm. a huge like rock scene here huge blues scene so let me ask you this. You coming to Nashville and playing in Nashville. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that you were in college in Memphis, so I'm not entirely sure your experience of, you know, outside of college. But, man, Memphis is just such a cool place and Nashville is such a cool place. Do you ever find that they cross over in good ways? Or I'm sure, but do they you find what the difference in, in, is? Okay, the, the difference in Nashville and Memphis musically is going to lie in the scene. 
Okay. The scene <laughs> in Memphis, Nashville scene is oversaturated with both music, artists, musicians, artists, and songwriters. Mm -hmm. All of that. There are. It's a hub. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna. That's 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 that's. Uh, yeah, part everybody of the comes course. here. Yep. But Memphis is oversaturated with artists. All the good musicians are either on tour with somebody in L.A. or in here or something like that, or in wow. Houston or something. Yeah, that's. But Memphis, the musician pool, is incredible. Like yeah. there, Nashville, I can pick and choose my favorite musicians. Memphis, I can throw a stick. Yeah. And hit the best dude you'll ever see in your life. Wow. Yeah, that's how Memphis has a reputation, a good and a bad reputation based in that. Like a lot of cats in different cities get angry when an influx of Memphis musicians show up. We're not one of those because that's always going to happen because we're right next door. You're so close. You're right next door. um, A lot of cats in other cities get angry when an influx of Memphis musicians show up because everybody starts picking them out for gigs. Oh, I see. Based off the strength. Kind of like maybe first. Yeah, yeah. Based off the strength of, yeah, they're from Memphis, but they heard. It's not that, you know, they have just like the Memphis reputation, but they came in with this specific Memphis musician that everybody knows has a good word and a good rep. So it's like, all right, if he says this guy needs to be hired, this guy's getting hired. So that, so that's interesting. So why would someone come to Nashville if they live in Memphis? Cause they're not going to make any money staying at home. Okay. It's yeah. Cause everybody comes to Nashville. I was not Nashville. the first. I, I'm, I was not the last and yeah. it's now it's, it's not stopping anytime soon. No, if it's it's musicians. Not. Yeah. Yeah. Because I remember there was one time at Acme, which I don't know if you had anything to do with this. It honestly was so long ago that I can't remember. But it was a lot of we, there was a lot of like uh, Nashville musicians, and they decided to do a Memphis kind of takeover night at Acme. Yeah, Alex headed it. Okay, so all right, because that's that's the guys so that not, he used to play with when we were in college. Okay, so yeah. there was a lot of. Memphis. Those are all my friends. Musicians. There was Nick Black. Yes. Yeah, yeah, those are all my those are all my oh, people. Yeah. And I <laughs> yeah. love Nick Black. I actually yeah. follow him now to this Nick's day. Nick's a good friend of mine. Yeah, oh. Nick, you should probably get. I could probably hook this up and get him. Oh on my can, god, that would be cool. He's got such a great voice. But I remember the night. I I don't know if it was officially called the Takeover Night, but I called it the Takeover Night. Like I was like, holy shit! Like the vibe mm-hmm. just completely changed up in but here. But see, that's how it is yeah. in Memphis okay. when you're playing. But like. That's going to be, you're going to get one of those shows a weekend. Or like yeah. you might get a few of them. Like the best bands are going to be at some random restaurant out in a suburb. That's crazy. That's how I was really getting money. Yeah. Um, but, you know, here that's not going to be the case. Yeah. The best bands are going to be somewhere at like Layla's or Robert's. Playing or, a honky tonk. Yeah. Or yeah. somewhere like Bourbon or something like that. And you're not going out to where I live and seeing like. A disgusting combo, like an incredible combo, something like that. You're not going out there where I live. Well, I thought that. for a second you said disgusting. I thought you were actually like describing like a like a like a a site like no, on I was one of these to, bar- bars. No, I was I, like, oh god. No, I, was, I, I had to I have to pull back my musician <laughs> lingo because we say things with a certain way. I would say this is complete carnage. Just it means this guy's really good. Or something like that. <laughs> yeah. No, it's fine and it's good. And like a lot of the stuff now for people, like a lot of the places you're talking about, like you know Bourbon Street, like. Uh, uh, like these are places that like Second Avenue, like Second Avenue is a huge place in Nashville for music. It's a historic uh, part of town, which actually half of it is not up and running and it'll take a while for it to get back to that. Broadway is a huge place. I'm sure a lot of people that come to Nashville know, you know, so even if people don't come down here for the music necessarily they come down here for broadway because they Mm -hmm. come down here for drinking and they come Mm -hmm. here for bands so it's like this is just a cool thing to get to know um i think what we're gonna do is take a quick minute Mm -hmm. we're gonna go in i'm gonna get everything set up for the cocktails okay and um we'll be right back sweet I am so excited because we are going to do a little fun part of this podcast and I feel like you're going to have a little bit more of an unfair advantage than some of the other people on here since Mitzi, your beloved, is a bartender. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you've seen all of this stuff before. You know a little bit of how to use it, but here we are. I bartended. Yeah, so that's right. Very short time. Yeah, he's like, wait a minute. I I said I bartended. I had to get, you know, I'm on ABC and everything. Oh (laughs) my God. I do all of it. Okay. All right. So I know you like tequila. Mm -hmm. And I know that you kind of really don't do a lot of cocktails um, necessarily, at least I've been told. 
So what I thought we would do is try to make a very simple cocktail, something that like maybe you can order when you're out or something you can make at home if you choose to, or your badass wife can make it for you. But um, it's kind of a version of a bee's knees, except mm-hmm. it's made with tequila. Okay. So, all right, what we're going to do, take some ice. Some ice. Ice. We're going to put it in the shaky shaker. Mm-hmm like three cubes and these are really big Patron glasses like I forget how large they are so I'm just letting you know I'm gonna pass that to you so I put just like three cubes in that and three cubes in your tin don't worry guys for you germaphobes who washed our hands and babe maybe just you should like put your hands on the table more so we can see what you're doing oh okay uh, you know all what right I'm saying that type of thing hello there everybody you. yeah let me just move my mic back okay so now that we got it you know, you got that jigger right in front of you. Mm-hmm. So we're going to do two ounces of tequila. Okay. So I know you know how to pour this, so I'm just going to hand it to you. And I just dropped tequila on my toe. That always happens to me. <laughs> like, I'm just like, why? Why is this happening? There you go, sir. Bye. Okay. So like the original Bee's Knees is made with gin. So okay. you're going to go actually all the way to the top for this. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. I should explain that to you. I went to the line. Yep. Well, that's one ounce. So we're going two, which is all the way to the top. And then you're going to pour it in the shaker. Okay. Okay. Pour it in that shaker. Don't be afraid of it. Just pour it in. Awesome. Okay. Now we're going to take the shaker Mm -hmm. and we're going to pour like the other side. So we're going to pour like, this is fresh squeezed lemon juice. Okay. Okay. This is annoying, but it's going to be good. So we're going to pour it up until like this first line here. Okay. And that's three quarters of an ounce. And trust okay. me, that's going to be enough because this is. I tried it earlier and it was pretty tart because I didn't use enough sugar. So I made I like a. That. I, <laughs> I, I made a honey simple, and uh, See, yeah, the good. honey was was good. But the way I kind of make it is I don't have any certain formula. I just kind of put the honey with the water and I just make it till I think it tastes good. Mm-hmm. So let's put a whole ounce of this honey simple in there. Cause I kind of feel like the more sugar, the better, but I'm not trying to give anybody diabetes. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. So you're like a pro. Yeah, all the way to the top. To the very tippy top. I just don't want to spill it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's just a rug. It's fine. <laughs> Are you, you want to put it in that tin? Okay, in theory, we have all the ingredients for this. So mm-hmm. we're gonna take the little shaker and we're gonna take, put it in the big shaker. Okay, we're gonna shake this maybe for like 10 seconds, all right? Okay. Shake, right. Yeah, shake it over the shake table, it. babe, so we can see shake what you're it. doing. Shake it, let's go. It's gonna be kind of annoying. Maybe we should just, <laughs> we should just like have fun with us shaking. <laughs> Sounds great. All right, okay, we're done. So going to slap this be like me who's got no <laughs> who's got no go. freaking <laughs> strength now the trick little, little trick is this to just put the mini tin in mm-hmm. the big tin okay. like this just hold it together and you're just going to strain it out now we take the angostura bitters mm-hmm. and we just put a couple on the top but i like to put three it said two but Fuck that. We should put three. Okay, three. Okay. Three. Three. And then we can take our little spoons Mm -hmm. and just stir this up nicely. And that, my friend, is a variation of a bee's knees with tequila. Oh my god. Here we are. We're making a cocktail together. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Pam. No problem. Yeah. Where's mine though, babe, huh? Am I not good enough okay. for you? Okay, I get it. <laughs> All yeah. right, you don't get one. I would drink that a lot. Right, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, now you can enjoy it for the rest of the show because it's yours. Yeah, it's the, it's the bitters I like. Yeah, the bitters kind of balances it out. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, I think like if I want a little bit of bub- bubbles, because sometimes depending on who's making the cocktail or where it is or where I'm getting it from, it might be a little flat. Mm-hmm. I can just put a little bit of soda water, just spray in the top of it, and That's then I'm exactly done. That's exactly what I'm doing. Yep. So I have a soda water bottle here. Do you want to try it? Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Sam's Club. Or no, actually, maybe I got that at Kroger. I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. They're not sponsoring this anyways. It's fine. Just a smidge. 
yeah, but I actually really dig this cocktail. When I first... Yeah, this is really good. Yeah, when I first pulled it this up... It's a very nice aftertaste. Yeah, I, I put too much lemon in it and not mm -hmm. enough sugar, and I was like, whoa, this is not... I read it wrong. I was like... Well, see, I probably like that. I'm not a really yeah? big sweet person. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it just it was so, like, so lemony. It just overtook everything. I was like, whoosh. I, I read it wrong. I do that sometimes. I was like, that's not how this is supposed to be made. <laughs> that's really mm -hmm. good, though. Good. Okay, so you could put that in your effervescent. repertoire. Yep, effervescent, mm -hmm. evanescence. Yeah, <laughs> all the same thing. And I can give that to Mitzi too, and we can go ahead and like <laughs> we could talk about that some more in our making syrup days. Her and I used to batch <laughs> together. That was hilarious. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that we have our cocktails, mm -hmm. and we can, we've talked a little bit about well, we've talked about you being a national musician, which I think is super important. I think it's really interesting, and so you're. You played blues, you played rock, you're still into everything, you're still mm -hmm. into playing blues, you're still into playing rock. Um, the difference between Memphis coming to Nashville, so over time, you start doing more and more in the scene, and you start writing your own music, and now you got the anti-heroes. And you had a little bit of a stint on a very famous TV show in Nashville <laughs> yeah. called Nashville. Yeah. If anybody remembers the show, um, <laughs> And I, I remember because I did a little bit of extra work on this show and I was walking by this outside trailer and I see you in the trailer and I was like, Ping? Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, oh, hey, how's it going? And I'm like, what the fuck? Ping is literally everywhere. And you're like, yep, I'm in Juliet's band. So if uh, people haven't watched Nashville or haven't seen it in a long time, uh, I think it's one of the main reasons why people started coming in droves to Nashville. It kind of gave them a little like taste of what it was like here in country music and whatnot. But Juliet Barnes was p played by Hayden Panettiere and you were in her band for what, a few seasons? Yeah, two. Two seasons. Yeah. That is so cool. Four and five. Four and five. So you, you actually got your own little, you guys got your own little trailer. Yeah. We didn't get our trailers. That was hilarious. Yeah, I got to eat with the famous people. <laughs> <laughs> was she was she nice was she cool yeah she was cool and like you know she spent time talking to us I met, met a few people oh, cool, cool people I um, was in a scene and sat next to um, Rhiannon Giddens mm -hmm. uh, Poye was actually her acoustic guitar player on that on that episode oh that's funny yeah, yeah I, was, I was just about to ask did anybody you know like were they in the band too or did you yeah well that's how I got on is like the guys that I still play with to this day one of the main guys I play with to this day his name is Jonathan Nixon yeah um, I talked a lot about how my friend Alex Kramer got me like you know gigs and stuff like that but I need to give equal praise to Jonathan Nixon who did the same for me and does the same for musicians old yeah. and new in town he's always got something he can put somebody on if somebody needs something somewhere or somebody needs to be introduced to somebody Jonathan is who introduced me to Tyson Leslie oh I didn't know that yeah. okay yeah. and Tyson's a mutual friend of ours yeah. so Tyson's the rock guy in Nashville for y'all yeah. who do not know like, yeah seriously like he's he's kind of got that reputation in bottom where it's like he's a little bit into everything uh he knows everybody he tries to keep you know tabs and kind of put people together and that's so important in the nashville industry and that's what mm -hmm. makes nashville so special mm -hmm. yeah nashville's As pretty awesome that yeah way. Yep. aside from like <clears throat> aside just from everything you know talent wise and music wise and opportunity wise like you know it's like people really do work well together here yes and, and that's super important so you did that for a couple of seasons mm -hmm. I mean, that was some great exposure there. And you got a chance to meet a ton of other people. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, you... dudes who I ended up, because, you know, we're not actually playing. Mm -hmm. There's dudes who are playing. There's folks who are playing on those sessions that are not on screen. Sometimes they are. Mm -hmm. but for the most part, I'm pretty sure they aren't. And so, but they're still only hiring a certain caliber of musicians to even fake play. Just Because case. that was... Um, I was coached through that. Oh, okay. Like I had to learn the song for real, for real. No kidding. And not to shade different shows, but if you look at other shows, mm -hmm. you can tell they're not playing. Oh, what do you mean, like I, this? Yeah, like or they're, like they're, they're or they're like playing, or they're, or they're playing like a chord. <laughs> on, they're playing a chord in the uh, in the video, yep. but the the, the 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 sound is a solo. Right. Yeah. It's so, like yeah. picking or you yeah, know, yeah. It's individual so, notes. Did you guys ever see that Michael J. Fox on uh, Back to the Future? Remember he played the uh, guitar in there. Oh, and How yeah. bad mm -hmm. that was. Remember yeah. that. You just want to let you know put that on. Oh well, yeah. It's kind there's of... no way you're getting that tone. I just <laughs> uh, what was that? Just a Gibson and a Fender. <laughs> he had a whole like compressed.
compressed chorus sound, but he was just plugged straight in, like, okay. Yeah, it's just like, no, we're <laughs> like not. Water. It's not the same thing. Oh, my God. So, okay, so that was a cool experience for you. Jonathan Nixon's a pretty cool guy. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, he, he does a lot of stuff. And that's the faces behind of what really makes people into rock music now. It, I mean, into the Nashville scene in general. It's like, these people, I'm like, man, some people you're going to recognize, like, if you've been around here. And some people, I think that people should know and recognize more. And you are one of those faces that a lot of people just know who you are from around here. And that's got to feel pretty good. So you literally are always doing something. So after you did the Nashville, you know, the show, Mm -hmm. you still have the Anna Heroes. You're still playing on Broadway. You're still playing gigs. You're writing your own music. And then what happened with your new project, Season Desist? Um, so Season Desist was born out of the ashes of a different band called Negro Terror. Yeah. And that's a Memphis band, Memphis hardcore, um, super serious in the hardcore scene there and nationally. Just, that's um, fucking awesome. Off the strength of the old lead singer and the connections that the new lead singer kept. And I, my best friend is was the old guitar player, now I'm the new guitar player, new lead singer. And so I just decided to help him on bass. And, you know, with the stuff that I like, you know, I'm a, I've been like, I've, I love punk music. I love mm-hmm. alternative music. I love goth shit. I love everything. Everything. Weird. Everything weird. I'm into it. <laughs> so it was easy for me as a musician who's been playing bass in a lot of different situations, as well as guitar, to fall into a hardcore band with my homie. Mm-hmm. And it's it's pure hardcore. There's no like, oh, it's hardcore mixed with a little bit. No, 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 no. Straight ahead. It's hardcore yeah, music. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of which, I got to go to one of your guys' shows. Uh, we'll be at Dark Matter on July 15th, I think, up oh, here. Hell yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so I mean, obviously, it doesn't sound like it was very hard for you to transition. You know, it doesn't sound like it's very difficult for you to transition at all between, you know, going from playing gigs to playing punk, to yeah. playing hardcore, to playing yeah. this. Do you have anything in mind right now that like is your favorite thing to do or anything new and musically you're exploring? Well, I got a I got a sort of YouTube channel dealing with comic books and like alternative music, but it's me and another black dude, so it's like black people doing rock music type ah, stuff. I love that. So we so so there's that, and I actually have the most fun doing that because that's us in this format, mm-hmm. basically talking shit. I love that. <laughs> oh I, my god, I have a lot of fun doing that. But musically, I. To be honest, my favorite thing to do is to play in my band. I like playing in Seasons and Desist because it's like I've been playing gigs and playing in bars up here. And I go to like a festival or hit up a bar in Memphis with those guys. And I'm back to like, you know, Circle Pits, which I hadn't seen in a long time until I started doing that. You know, I was like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Circle Pits, loud. Like, you know, I don't I do not do that up here that much. So, right? yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm like, I get my daily dose, get my, you know, uh, occasional dose of that. So, yeah. Oh, my God. That's so cool. And um, that reminds me, like, the first, I, I don't mean to, like, interject because I want to know about this, but, like, the first, I've always been into hard rock because I think you you kind of described it perfectly. Is that, like, I love all types of music. Whatever my ear listens to, I like. But, like, there's a certain amount of energy that I get from rock music that I don't mm-hmm. necessarily get from other things. And I think it kind of fuels something it makes me happier listening to pantera makes me happier i don't know how to Mm -hmm. explain that to people you just if you don't get it i you know i don't know how to it's it's fine if you don't i just don't know how to make people understand that it it gives me this certain vibe helps me deal with my emotions but i think like after the first seven months of being here and when i was working downtown i was working at acme which acme doesn't play a lot of country but they they play a lot of other different music but still like i was going from like two different environments so i remember one day it was a saturday morning i was like i started singing a song you know a little bit out loud to what the band was playing and i was like nashville did it it broke me it finally broke me it broke my whole spirit with, like rock music and everything you were else. like what is this i was like oh my god because it was just so hard for me for a while i was just like you know it's background noise and whatever but i was like I know that feeling. I know that feeling specifically (laughs) because it was when I was singing some 
hick ass country song that I just like didn't <laughs> well, unprompted sitting down in the bar and drinking listening to the band I'm like oh man they're playing this one but it's because I knew the song and I was yep. like you know I know it this more intrinsically I'm like so I should be able to like at least turn it out a little bit but I was like the, but the problem was the band was good right, right. so, <laughs> so you're thinking it you're yeah, like oh yeah. god this they is finally bumping. happening <laughs> yeah. oh my god yeah. that's hilarious so um, so where do you see yourself at like now like you you've got a new uh, album coming out soon. Is it a new album or a new song only? Both. Both. I'm sitting on them. Uh, okay. Uh, and I'm sitting on a music video as well. Um, I'm I just cannot waiting wait on to a see proper, this. I know, right? I'm just waiting on a proper time to release them because I didn't release my last album on completely deaf ears, but I just did it. Yeah. And I want to put a little bit more planning and a little bit more effort into it. And right now, if I just dropped it, it, I, it would be a little bit less of the same because I spent more money on it this time through. I sure. spent more time on it this time through and like actually calling better musicians. And like I did a lot of this work on this record myself playing keyboards. I've been playing every instrument on one song except for the horns and Serena singing black background vocals. Wow, that's but, cool. But um, um, I got a lot better musicians on this one and a lot better team as far as engineering, mixing, and mastering. So I don't want to throw this out and like nobody hear it and then yeah. me be like, it's time to get to work on my next one. Right. You want to enjoy yourself a little mm -hmm. bit, enjoy like the fruits of your labor. Plus, I mean, this time I specifically went out to make a blues record. Yeah. And it's not like it's different than your normal blues record. Like everybody else's blues record, I feel like their requirements is like, okay, I gotta have a shuffle. I gotta have a slow blues. I gotta have a Chicago. I gotta have a Texas, yada, yada, <laughs> yada. Mine is I'm taking the ideas of blues and putting them to different types of music. Not like, okay, I'm gonna do a little Latin shuffle here and a little you know jazz blues there. No, that's been done plenty of times. I'm trying to take sounds that were popular from like 90s alternative rock with their fuzz pedals and like their chorus pedals and their drum sounds and the way they would put a drum sample on top of a snare hit and have both in the mix. That's cool. Stuff like that. That's what I'm doing when you I go for a blues record. You're trying to get more record. creative with it. And I put like lo-fi hip-hop stuff in it too okay. and some like 90s R&B funk and a little bit of heavy, like a lot of heavy alternative rock. That's but like, awesome. Yeah, that's, yeah. You're that's, just kind of blending it. like. But it's still blues. It's still blues. Yeah. I really dig that. Like I think that's going to be a good thing. Um, what's the album called? Conjure Man. Conjure Man. Yeah. That's a fun name. Where'd you yeah. get that from? Because I wanted me a song that had like a, a lot of blues, a lot of a lot of blues songs. This is like another requirement for a blues person. But a lot of blues, <laughs> a lot of blues people have like this, like super. They all got like a supernatural song, like, and it's it, you won't think of it like everybody. It doesn't come the normal way. Like one of the main ones for me is Al Green's. Oh, it's actually a Temptations tune, but Al Green turned it into a blues tune, and so it's called "Can't Get Next to You, Babe." And it's basically. It's like the same. It's like the same subject matter as Voodoo Child. Okay. It's like that's what I'm talking about. Like somebody, like everybody has like a, a song with a subject matter like Voodoo Child. I got you. And so that's what the song Conjure Man is. But that's what I also named the album because it's a blues record. That's cool. Yeah. That's so cool. And it's not like a Voodoo Childish song. It's probably more like a Citizen Cope kind of song. But it's still like a two quarter with like a chorus and like yeah. That's, that's it. awesome. Yeah. That's great. And how long you've been working on it for? I started it during the pandemic and I finished it about mid to late last year. Damn, good yeah. for you. Which I feel like is actually not that long considering, but yeah. the pandemic I feel like gave a lot of artistic... Uh, <laughs> when I say I started it during the pandemic, I started writing. I didn't start recording. Oh, sure. I started yeah. recording January yep. 2021. Yeah, well, I mean, and that's the thing is that albums and songs take you know a lot longer to, to write than people think, which... Dan and I talk about this all the time is that people, you know, <clears throat> what do what do people value music yeah. wise anymore? Like, what does someone value? Like, I remember years ago when Radiohead came out with one of their albums, they did. They put it out there and they were like, hey, whatever you guys want to pay us for. Yeah, I, I don't still listen to that one. That's in rainbows. I yep. still it's the double album. Yep, they're like, whatever yeah. y'all want to pay us for. And they found that. Oh, my God, this was like 10 years ago. They found that the average person only paid them two dollars. I think. Oh, yeah. And I. I, I when you think about how much work goes in to your recording, your writing, that, your this. They made so much more money than people who released everything through the, because that was an indie through release. Through labels? Yeah, that yeah. was an indie release. They had help with distributors and stuff to get, get like posters and Hot Topic and stuff <laughs> and Rainbows sure. posters and like FYE and all that stuff. Yeah. But um, that album was specific. Like they, when they sold it online, you could get CDs and you could get records from like record stores or you could get like records at the show. Or you can get but, it online. Yeah, but you could get it online, and mm -hmm. they, they 
they they they put the pay pay what you can thing up there and they made more money when they did that than people who just released stuff regularly because this is this is right around the time where album sales were like when people were realizing that album sales just were never ever going to be it again they're never like, going to come no back the way there's no revitalizing that yeah no that's so interesting hmm. that leads us to like for another conversation about talking as to you know how pe- how artists nowadays how musicians survive mm-hmm. if you think about you know uh, it's like, why not be independent and release your own stuff and keep all your own money? Yeah, well, that's I, I've What's never hunted a label. I got offered a contract with Capitol Records when I was 21. Nice. And I mean, just to be offered that is cool. Yeah, but this is before I was a music business major at the different school. I told you about that earlier. Yeah. But all it took was me just glancing through that. The contract to was realize. to realize that because it was back when I was in a band and I, when I was in a band, I was writing most of the material. Like the they, the band was doing their part, they were putting in work. I'm not gonna say they weren't doing anything, but I was writing the songs. So I was sure. the lead singer. I was playing guitar and like yeah. Play, yeah. So I'm writing the songs, and we're looking at a five way split of a five point deal. Yeah. So you want 95 percent of my shit. Yep. And of that five percent, I'm gonna get one. Right. Uh, after all this work I've done just to get here, and I was like, you know what? Nah, and that's when I realized you can make a living as a musician. Yeah, and so I decided to do both artist and musician, and that's been like my sort of mission as a guitar player, a musician, and a singer slash songwriter. It's like I want both spaces occupied because if you have both spaces occupied, and I want to do work as an artist, that means I don't have to venture that far outside of where I'm at to find what I need. Sure. Because my band members and the anti heroes are just guys that I play other gigs with. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's so important of everything that you just said, because a lot of people that don't have the knowledge, like, you know, they get screwed over a little bit yeah. or just in general. But it, it just doesn't make sense anymore for people to not for me. I haven't seen a good reason for people to seek out anything like that when you can make your own money. And the cool thing about a place like Nashville is that the music is so ingrained here and has been so ingrained here for such a long time that people expect and I don't understand why more places in the world in this in the country mm-hmm. have live music because they would benefit so much from that but moving here when like I was like yeah I kind of need off because I want to go to a writer's night or whatever like they were like absolutely like mm-hmm. people understand they make room for that here and it's not like that a lot of places. And I've had a lot of safety and cynicism from that because me being a musician and being an artist from a very young age, but I was also working the career as a straight up musician, I didn't get enticed like a lot of people did mm. by a lot of other people like dangling meat in front of them per se and giving them a lot of cotton t- t- tall tales and like putting cotton candy in their face saying look what I got I was really very apprehensive about that on the fr- like if you couldn't give me a gig and tell me how much I was getting paid right. I'm not I'm not going I'm not doing the work I'm not coming to the audition none of that right. none of all that I'm not yeah. wasn't that guy I, I actually turned down a gig last week because a guy that I've known for a long time sent me a message and was like, this is an opportunity to change your musicality and your life. And I was like, no, it's not. Right. Not for me. I can get on a cruise ship anytime I want to. Uh-huh. Like, I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I, I don't need you to, I don't need you to like try to tell me that what I'm doing isn't as important as your weekly gig that you've been doing for forever because you have a guy leaving and you need another one that bad. Yeah. Like I've been, yeah. I so, get that. Yeah. Well, it's it's almost, it's like a baiting thing, you know, yeah. and it's like people you don't. Know, I love when they, they offer exposure. <laughs> Oh, oh my you god! Get so much exposure, man! Yeah. Bullshit. That exposure mm, will will help tablet. you with distribution, and your it's exposure, and it's like, well, how do you measure exposure in money? Because like, find we, me <laughs> any other job, and I mean, I'm not just talking about like what people consider a real job. Right. Find me any other job in the entertainment industry where someone offers exposure. Yeah, that's true. Even extras get paid. Yeah. <laughs> Not much, but we get paid. Yeah, money. (laughs) And they're telling you they're they're telling you how much you're gonna get. Right. Yeah. So and that's that's and that's way more exposure than anything because you're literally on camera in front of millions of people. Yeah. (laughs) A couple of questions I want to ask you. Mm -hmm. Proudest achievement so far. Last year, proudest. Mm -hmm. It's probably my own record, but last year I did play with Alicia Keys. Oh. 
my God, I know. I want. I was going to talk about that too, but your own record, that was the first thing. Yeah. <laughs> that is such a big yeah. deal. That's yeah. such a huge fucking deal. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And and obviously, let's talk about the Alicia Keys. And, and you, you have something to do with Black Opry. Yeah, I'm like the de facto music director because they use my my band to back their artists. So I'm That's like awesome. the musical liaison between musicians and the artists on stage that are playing. And um, basically, like I told you earlier, my band, I mean, Anti Heroes is one part blues band, one part, part heavy alternative rock band, one part fusion band, jazz funk fusion band. And when we're back in Black Opry, we're just a, a country combo that you would see somewhere like Roberts or the the actual Grand Ole Opry review because that's yeah. the skills we have because it's this it's we're all cruise ship guys. Everybody in my band like has oh, done something funny. akin to like cruise ships or touring with a musician or plays yeah. on soundtracks or, and which I did leave that out. I sang a cover for a. Uh, this is actually what I'm proud of, but it didn't make it to the final product. Oh. But a few years ago, I sang a cover of. Mad World by Tears for Fears yes. for, for the Wendell and Wilde soundtrack, that oh, claymation movie that came yeah. out on Netflix. Yeah, You sang on that? Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Lo- great freaking song. Great song. Yeah. Oh my God. So how did you come with uh, the Alicia Keys things? That was big because I was there that day that your wife came yeah. to I Acme. I think I bought drinks from you that day. Yes. <laughs> and uh, when I heard about it, I was like, obviously so happy for you. So I was under the impression something a little bit different, but please correct me. So you were playing a big festival around here. I was playing, playing pilgrimage down in Franklin. It yeah. was a Black Opry gig, and we had my band. And right before we went on, the uh, founder, CEO of Black Opry, Holly Go, she goes, "I need to talk to you right quick." And I was like, "Oh man, like I hope she's not trying to add another song." Yeah, that doesn't like sound that. good. You're like, like, you know, it's like because that's usually the, that's usually the deal. Oh, which I'm like, that's, which is no, t- which is like a short order for me, Poye, and Juju. But at the same time, it's like I have I'm about to go b- play a bunch of songs that I've never played before that Let's, I won't play I don't after add today. One so more I to can't like, like I have to keep these ones that are in my head in mm-hmm. my head for about another hour, and then right. I can give you whatever you need. Right. Yeah. But so she goes, even crazier. She goes. Do you guys want to play Alicia Keys tonight? And so you don't say no. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like <laughs> yeah. Why would you ever say no to that? Because it's like you know, have you ever heard my friend Holly talk? It's kind of like me, where it's like it's sort of like like Dari or something, where it's very low, almost <laughs> deadpan. And the way she asked me was like, um, she's like, I got something I need to ask you. And so because you know, if, you, if you're about to ask somebody, do they want to play Alicia Keys? It's like, yo, bro, yeah, Alicia Keys tonight. What's up? You you good? You want to do this? You want you want to do that? But she's like, I got something I need to ask you. Um, you guys want to play Alicia Keys tonight? And I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, but did you guys, she's like, yeah, yeah, but is Alicia, Keys, Alicia Keys, and I was like, tonight, and she's like, yeah, like, she's at a send, and I'm like, okay, so I said, yeah, and then, being the musicians so that we cool. are, the first thing we did after we got off stage is like, we need a song. We need, we need the song. Oh my song. god! Because so we were, because we were like, we're playing with Alicia Keys. We got songs to learn. We like, oh we need, my we need a song. god! So you're going to <laughs> yeah. play a set, and you're already thinking about it was what you're going to play. I'm another. not going to be exaggerating. I'm not going to exaggerate what we did. We did. We played one song, which we learned pretty much on the way. What song was it? Um, uh, Underdog. Is that her song? Yes. Holy shit! So, okay, so you get done playing with Pilgrimage Fest. You go to Ascend, which, by the way, is a fantastic venue. Mm-hmm. Well, you come get drinks for me first, then you go to Ascend. And then your wife was trying to get tickets to the show, and she ended up getting tickets to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, so you, so was it at the end of her set, or? Close to the end of their set. Close to the end of her set. And we're walking out to go, like, do the practice, because she's That's warming fantastic. up and rehearsing. And we're walking out, and we're walking out to the stage, accompanied by some of the hugest security guards I've ever seen in my freaking <laughs> life, dude. I don't understand how you tailor suits this big, but those suits were tailored nice to these <laughs> dudes that were bigger than football players and taller than basketball players. Uh, like, <clears throat> And then here comes Jill Scott with another security detail oh my God. around her. And then we're going over to Alicia Keys, and she's like telling us what to do, and we're listening to her and her music director, and me and Poy are holding two acoustic guitars, and the rest of Black Opry singing. And like everywhere we move, this dude snaps a finger, and like two giant security detail is like basically like her avatar. <laughs> <laughs> her avatar. Yeah. Her big strong avatar yeah. came in. So you guys get out on stage, and that's a that's a pretty big stage. You get out there, it must have been kind of overwhelming at that point. Yeah, but it was one song. It was it was just over as quickly as it began. 
and it went on my resume. That's awesome. <laughs> and she was cool with you guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, so can you just tell us a little bit for a second before we have to say goodbye to you about Black Opry? Like what is the... Black Opry is a space for black musicians that play mostly country, but you can... It's basically anything that's not hip hop and R&B. Mm -hmm. And if it is, it's definitely country tinged. But uh, and this Black Opry is never a thing to say this is new black people doing this, but it is a space for black people in community doing such a thing. That's fucking awesome. Yeah, that's great. That's super cool. I, I know I'm so, a, I'm so proud of the fact that you came on here and I'm so like, I just feel so cool about the fact that you like, I got a chance to like talk music more with you and mm -hmm. like you get, like I got to know a little bit more about what you do because like, I honestly, I think I know what you do. Because I, I've talked to your wife so much and because I've seen you out places, but to really get to kind of like do a deep dive or a deeper dive and just talk about all facets of music and like all the stuff that you've been doing was really, really cool. It was yeah. really an honor. And I'm so happy really that you came on. good to talk about it because these aren't the questions that you get asked normally. Yeah. Especially you get asked some very basic questions with doing any kind of podcast or interview. And it's like, hey, how do you feel about this? And it's like, well, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Yeah. You know, no, but that is. So I appreciate the questions. Of course. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is, I was like, I'm gonna have some like you know, run of the mill questions. I was, I'm always gonna want to know what your first album was because I just need to fucking know that that's about important. people. Like, it's that's, important to me. That's a, a lot of people judge people off of things like horoscopes and stuff like that. <laughs> well, I'm not. No, we gonna talk about music. We're Let's talk about yeah, music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like. I, it's it's just it's different but anytime i get a chance to like really kind of dive in to know more about like your music and what you do and uh, just everything like playing music here like opportunities like especially with the whole alicia keys things that's something that is just a super cool opportunity that someone in her platform and her position you know gave a bunch of musicians a chance to like be a part of and mm -hmm. that's a really cool thing so can you tell people where they can find you obviously we're going to list them at the end mm -hmm. of this video but tell huh. us when your new album is going to be out my new album will be out later this year this single will be out before the summer is over it's called salty it's salty. a straight ahead blues song um, i listened to it <laughs> yeah, it's on youtube yeah, yeah. live and it, it was fucking awesome yeah we have, a, we have a video of marcus king playing it with us yes but there's a video preview um i have a a sort of podcast, but I call it an edutainment channel on YouTube, <laughs> focusing around American entertainment, specifically at the vein of comic books and rock music with my buddy Caleb. And that's called Culture Core Academy. Nice. And that's all you can find that. And all of the links are one word. Um, and all of my socials are Ping Rose Plays, all one word. Yes. My and that's website your website too. Is dot com. That's a great website. Yeah. So guys, if you're digging it, hit Ping up. Um, if you're now, you have plenty of gigs uh, throughout town. I know you mm -hmm. got a couple of residencies. You want to just tell us where they are? Um, yeah, I have a residency every Friday night from nine to twelve at Black Rabbit with my trio. Nice. And that's where we play not stripped down versions, but more of like a sort of jazz fusion blues rock trio type thing of my songs and some others. And I have a full-on loud two-guitar rock band every Sunday night from 8 to 12 at Bowie's. Yes. And I love that. Again, Dan, we're going to have to go there. We're there. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> I've been down to Bowie's the house. on yeah. a Sunday night the past. Uh, for, um, that was actually your show was like yeah. the last Please show I've been out it. to I need for friends a while. Because like, see, when you're in Nashville, you don't get everybody who's down with the down with the sickness that way as far yeah, as rock yeah. music is concerned. Right. So when some, when some friends come in and see me like, you know, because you're seeing me playing anywhere else other than Bowie's, I'm not even playing that loud. I'm not playing half the tunes I'm playing in there. Even right. some of my own, like the, I have rock tunes and stuff like that. So I totally. get to play my shit in Bowie's. Yes, yeah, yeah. and I love that. And uh, that, so the last time I went out anywhere, unfortunately, um, just because it's been so long, mm -hmm. was it your gig? Yeah. So I plan to make that happen more. Let's go. <laughs> but thank you for coming on. Thank God uh, for having me. Yes, it was so good to see you and um, we will talk more soon. Yeah. All right. <laughs> bye. Awesome, bye. <laughs>